Tokyo Game Life, a Tokyo-based video game podcast focusing on Nintendo and gaming culture in Japan's capital. Your host Mono here to bring you a slice of gaming life from Tokyo. On this episode, I'm joined by Rockman Cosmo to chat about the Rockman Feature Phone Preservation Project. Rockman, aka Mega Man. Before smartphones, Japan was in a completely different universe when it came to phones, and there are many phone games from huge franchises that are at risk of being lost forever. We talk all about these fascinating titles and how some hardworking folks are trying to save them. In the games I chat about, what else? Fire Emblem Engage. Three Houses was my game of the year in 2019, but how does Engage stack up? And I'll talk about the latest news, including a mini feature on the indie games event, Tokyo Game Dungeon. Let's jump right into the feature on the Rock Band Feature Phone Preservation Project with Rock Band Cosmo. This episode's feature is about the Rock Band Feature Phone Preservation Project. Before smartphones, Japan had a robust ecosystem of unique phones with games from classic franchises such as Rock Band, aka Mega Man. Although many of these unique feature phone games are lost to time, there are people working to give these titles another chance, including today's special guest. So guest, please introduce yourself. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Rockman Cosmo. Um, I am a Mega Man mega fan who works to preserve its history. So I am the head of multiple different projects that aim to preserve as much Mega Man history as possible. So I lead some fan scanlation projects, which aim to translate Japanese materials into English materials, such as guidebooks or comics. And those have all been out of print for multiple decades. So we're trying to get that to the widest audience as possible. And I am also the leader of the Rock Command Feature Phone Preservation Team, and where we try to preserve these lost flip phone Rockman games that were exclusively released in Japan. And we have secured three of them, and those will definitely be touched on in detail later in the episode. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, thanks for joining me today. Let's lay a bit of groundwork. What are feature phones? Feature phones, I guess, to most people are basically flip phones or dumb phones, as Americans call them, except that they are very, very specific to Japan. And mm. I believe the Japanese have a term that I'm going to butcher, like garake. And yes. it basically means in retrospect, like Galapagos phones. And that's because Japan had such an interesting um, culture around flip phones like that's that's so much admiration and like all this kind of culture around it that couldn't really exist anywhere else kind of like the animals of the galapagos islands mm. so basically they had that retrospective term that's a little negative because it couldn't survive anywhere else this special culture but basically when we say feature phones it's essentially a flip phone from japan and these flip phones in japan had many special features that flip phones and dumb phones everywhere else didn't really have especially storefronts to buy video games and a lot of advanced internet features like a browser and like looking at stocks and sports and watching television for example like they, they had very very advanced internet features and i think that and the unique culture that surrounded them in japan is what truly made them different from other dumb phones of the early 2000s Yes, before smartphones took over, Japan had a really large domestic industry of phones that were far more advanced than in the West. And they often had a unique feature set, like you mentioned. And yes, they had the kind of unusual name of Galapagos phone. Yeah, Garake. And as someone who lives in Tokyo, every now and then you can still see people use them, but typically they're older and they mostly just use it for like Sudoku and things like that. So let's run down the games of the preservation project. What titles specifically is the Rock Band Feature Phone Preservation Project focusing on? The three games that we've secured are Rockman.exe Phantom of Network, Rockman.exe Legend of Network, and Rockman Dash Great Adventure on Five Islands. How did you discover these games in the first place, and what drew you to wanting to preserve them? I've been a Mega Man fan for many, many years, and I've played so many of the games, and there are many, many different sub-series within Mega Man. I've just seen... Some of these phone games just kind of on the side, like in passing, like, oh, I didn't know that uh, Mega Man Battle Network had a phone game in Japan. Oh, that's interesting. But I never really put much thought into it. But in the middle of 2020, I formally joined the online rock band community. And one of my first projects was to translate this Japanese exclusive guidebook um, called the Rockman Dash Great Adventure Guide. 
and they had a bunch of concept art and scribbles for the Rockman Dash video game, also known as Mega Man Legends in other countries. And through there, I was kind of drawn to video game preservation because I saw so many pieces of video game history that were just basically being overlooked. And one of them was definitely these feature phone games. But I never really thought about joining such an effort until the figurehead of the American Mega Man community, whose name is Proto Dude, he put out this call on Twitter that said, "Oh, you know, we found this phone with these um, with, with, with this Rockman EXE game, or something along those lines." They just wanted more research to be done on this phone, so I DM'd him and I did some research on the phone's ecosystem, and then he said, "Okay, you know, it looks like you know your stuff. You know, we'd like to join our project." And then that's basically when this Rockman Feature Phone project was started, because it turns out that one of the other correspondents um, knew somebody who had these um, Rockman.exe feature phone games on their phone, and they were willing to give it to us. And basically, I had just joined that project without really knowing how big it would turn out to be. And over time, I guess it just became a de facto leader. And now it seems like I am a leader in this project. And yeah, it's just been one wild ride. And I can't wait to talk about some more. Rockman EXE Phantom of Network and Legend of Network is definitely the most timely, considering the Mega Man Battle Network collection is coming out fairly soon. How are these games different from the many other Mega Man Battle Network titles? The surprising thing is they're actually more similar to the other Battle Network titles than you might expect. Hmm. So Phantom of Network was released in 2004 for AU devices, and then 2009 for Docomo devices, and those are just um, different telecom carriers in Japan, and they had um, different platforms for their phones. So, the, so both of these games were released in the basically the middle of the 2000s, around the time when the other Mega Man Battle Network Game Boy games were coming out. Hmm. And each of these games had eight chapters that were released on a schedule. Um, I cannot remember the schedule, but I think it might have been bi-weekly. And basically, these games, to their core, are very, very much the Game Boy games transplanted onto a phone. So, for example, the very unique um, Mega Man Battle Network uh, battle system with a 3x3 grid, Mm. and you're selecting the battle chips, that's 100% preserved, basically. Um, It plays exactly like the Game Boy counterparts. Um, The only difference is and sacrifices they had to make were with the overworld most notably in the real life overworld because usually you have this isometric view and you're able to go around into the town and talk to npcs but here it's basically been reduced to a bunch of text boxes because of the phone limitations but in the cyber world itself where mega man runs around as a computer program that's still pretty much preserved except it's from a top-down view instead of an isometric angle but other than that it's pretty much comparable like they they even have some recurring bosses from the Game Boy games come into this phone game as cache data or some kind of a Navi ghost or something like that. How about the combat? Of course, the GBA games only have two buttons, but when it comes to feature phones, they have a much more, I guess, complex button layout. Yeah, yeah. So from what I know, I think that the button layout is pretty much identical to the Game Boy games, like it doesn't use hmm. more buttons than the than the GBA. I'm pretty sure. Um, like I know that the Street Fighter 2 port on the cell phone does use a bunch of the buttons. Like even has a, like I think the pound sign is a dedicated Hadouken button to oh. that game. <laughs> but for the Rockman the EXE games, I don't believe they use mo- most of the buttons. I believe just probably I don't know maybe the one or two button. I, I don't have the game on me, so I don't know the exact <laughs> controls, but Based on what I see, um, I, I doubt it uses many of those um, n- number pad buttons. Rockman Dash Great Adventure on Five Islands is ironically the most recent title in the Mega Man Legend series. Does this game also play similarly to the other two titles? It does, yeah. Hmm. If you look at if you look at gameplay online, it really does look like you slap the Mega Man Legends game <laughs> onto a cell phone. Like you even preserve the somewhat infamous tank controls. Mm. Um, where like left and right turns you, and then if you press forward and back, you go forward and back. So you have to kind of strafe in an awkward fashion. But yeah, the combat's pretty much the same. It even has a lock-on system, just like the Legends games did on the PS1. So they also have that, and then a lot of the enemies, and like and one of the bosses just ripped straight out of Legends One at the very end. Mm. So 
yeah, what yeah, surprisingly just like the EXE games, it's very very similar to its PS1 counterpart, you know, and that's and and that's just one of many remarkable things about these games and what they're able to do. Why isn't Capcom putting a big effort into re-releasing these titles on modern hardware? Do you think the issue comes from the time and money it would take for localization, or is it a software issue, or a mix of both? I think it's a mix of both. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, I am I don't I don't work at Capcom, so I wish I could give a concrete <laughs> answer. But uh, yeah, I, I think there's 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 one giant roadblock. It's emulating these games, and I think that's a hurdle that most companies are not willing to go through because. Well, you know, these are these are just a bunch of games on a flip phone, right? And hmm. like, Me- Mega Man has not been a very well-selling franchise for Capcom. Like, most of its millions of sales are made up of hundreds of games, hmm. and like, it, it doesn't seem like something that Capcom would put so much effort into. So that would make like a dedicated um, emulator for these kinds of flip phone Java games. And as we know, like, our project has a developer of a java micro edition emulator and yeah it's just very 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 hard to emulate these types of games for all sorts of technical reasons like it's taken this user years and years just to come up with something you know feasible so i think that capcom probably would not want to go through that much effort to re-release the games so i think if they wanted to release them in the future there is this company called g mode and G Mode was a publisher for a bunch of feature phone games back in the early 2000s. And they've mm-hmm. recently been re- re- releasing their titles as Unity recreations on the Switch and Steam called G Mode Archives. And, start, and recently they've started doing a new line called G Mode Archives Plus, in which they partner with third party, what we have, third, third party publishers like um, Atlas, for example. And basically, Atlas lets GMO do like a one-to-one Unity recreation of their, for example, Shin Megami Tensei feature phone game. And then they get re-released on the Switch and then later Steam. So I suspect that Capcom is probably doing something with them because there was this Japanese user who was going about recreating Phantom of Network. And all of a sudden, Capcom took down his project. And that was very suspicious because usually Capcom never takes down fan projects unless they're making money off of it. And this guy definitely was not. So I have a feeling that Capcom has something in the works for Phantom of Network, but I doubt they're going to go through the effort to emulate themselves. They're probably going to do some kind of a recreation, either in-house or through um, G mode. I want to dig more into the actual preservation process. Why are these games so difficult to preserve and emulate? Is it a matter of there just not being enough hardware with these games on it? Or is the software structure also a hurdle? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So there are many facets which make this pretty hard. Like the first, like the, I think one of the biggest roadblocks is just getting access to these games in the first place. Because unfortunately, like you can't just go out and find one of these games easily. You have to find someone who's willing to get, send their phone to you in Japan. And as we've learned, um, due to the culture and nature of Japan, you know, not as many share the same view of preservation as people overseas do. Like definitely in Japan, like piracy is looked down upon and a lot of our work is kind of viewed in that same lens. So it's a little more difficult to find somebody who's willing to send us a phone. And that's why I'm endlessly grateful to the Japanese user who did send us uh, his phone with the Rakamenda EXE games. But once you even have the phones themselves, it's just, it's just, I, Basically, they, they're throwing the book at you here. There are a lack of data sheets <laughs> for the CPU and the NAND chips. And basically, it's like, like a, a, any little thing possible, they're going to make it hard for you to do. Like just cracking into the phone itself, like like you see like DS hardware hacking and things like that, right? But that's just one console here. We got hundreds of, hundreds of different phones where one hack into one phone is not going to apply to another one because they got a different pinout, for example. Mm. And... For our phones, like the EXE phones, the games are directly stuck on the phone itself, which means that we got to hack directly into the phone. Currently, we're trying to reverse engineer the phone's NAND chip, and then we're going to find a way to dump the firmware. And once again, that's specific to every phone. So like, what, what, what can be done to this phone could be done in theory to another phone, but it would always be a little slightly different. The Japanese just put so many different layers of copyright protection onto these phones. For example, our Five Islands game is on, a, is on an SD card. 
these games could be moved to SD cards, and one could think, oh, I could take my SD card with these game files in them, and I could just put them into my computer, and voila, I got the files. Well, unfortunately, these um, SD cards have something called a C2 Cryptomeria cipher, and this is a really, really powerful cipher, and basically all the data on there is encrypted. So even though one could save a game on SD card, now they have to deal with cracking this crazy um, DRM on there. And it, it's very, very difficult to do that. Um, you, need, you need a substitution box, you need device keys, which are stored inside the device's firmware. So currently we're trying to crack um, our phone's d device firmware in order to get this device key because otherwise like there, there's no other way to get into these SD cards. And we're lucky that we were able to get a more complete dump for SD card. Um, there are many other games like this, this one Kingdom Hearts game, I believe, that has a lot of its files on an SD card and they're struggling to get it off. So yeah, just at, at any moment, like they just basically want to throw something at you, a big roadblock to prevent you from getting into this phone in the first place. Is there any specific hardware that you're searching for or is it really just any type of phone is okay? Any type of phone, I think, is okay. Like, basically, we got, we got to take what we can get. Like, we, we can't just say, all right, you know, I want all of these lost games to be on an SH10C phone, for example. You know, that, that's not feasible. But there are definitely some phones that can be e more easily dumped than others. Like, actually, most recently, um, some LG phones, I believe, um, were able to have some of, like, their pinouts determined and some of their preloaded games were dumped. But... But, but, but those games are really like small and not very notable, like just a bunch of tiny mini games. But like if someone does have a game on an LG phone, it is in theory easier to dump. But ultimately, I think it's kind of a giant equalizer, basically, where all these phones are equally tough to get into. So it doesn't really matter um, which model a game is on. What kind of hardware are you using to extract the games from these phones? I have to imagine it's quite old and specific considering the one-of-a-kind structure of many Japanese feature phones. We do have some specialized hardware to crack into like, the pinouts of these phones. There's something called a Riff Box, something else called a JTAGulator. Basically, all of these just read, um, I think, the pinouts of the phones and try to get data from them, intercept data from them. Each of the chips on the phones can be analyzed using different types of programming devices. So basically you would just go on, for example, you know, eBay and look up a programming device that can read this specific line of you know, Qualcomm chips or something along those lines. My team member, Naya Shinoda, definitely knows more about the technical aspect of things than I do, but I think that's pretty much the general gist of it, where you just got to use those devices like the Rift Box and the JTAGulator to search these different pinouts. And then if you do have specific chips, you got to look up specific devices that can read these chips. But luckily, they're not too dated, especially the Rift Box and JTAGulator devices where they're constantly in development and there's no, there's, there's no type of uh, fear of them going, uh, of them getting old anytime soon. Let's talk about Craze, one of the Ukrainian developers working on the project. How does he get involved and what's his current status on the project? So Craze's involvement in the feature phone preservation community as a whole predates me joining it. Uh, I think he's been around for many, many years at this point. He is just a technical wizard. Like he just knows any kind of hardware, any kind of phone hardware in and out. Um, so he got involved with this project because when it started at yeah, very, very, very end of 2020, pretty much January 2021, I went on the search to find some more team members and I stumbled upon a Discord server called Kavi Break. And that's the most centralized community of feature phone preservationists that I've ever seen. And and basically when I asked for help, all the users pointed me to Craze just because like, oh my goodness, you know, Craze would be so much help with this. He knows so much. So it was already kind of like a mythical figure at that point. <laughs> so I was so glad that I got in contact with him because he's an incredibly nice guy. And yeah, he just Basically, he, he's our technical wizard. Like all of our test phones pretty much go to him and all of our testing and reverse engineering the NAND chip and reading it. A lot of that is just basically his territory. And that's the main thing that he's been doing. But recently, currently, um, he's been 
he's been kind of in the middle of the terrible war that's happening in Ukraine because mm. crazy he lives in Kiev and, and and he was right there when the war started and of course that definitely hindered his progress you know he had to go to a bomb shelter for safety but in an incredible act of courage he actually left his bomb shelter to go back to his home to retrieve our supplies for this rock band project oh wow and i that that is just unbelievable dedication to the project like he did he never had to go to those links so he con- he continued to assist the feature film preservation community in the bomb shelter like he posted photos of different games he was working on and it was obvious that he was definitely not in a well-lit area he was definitely in a bomb shelter but despite that situation going on around him he's still trying to help us as much as he can and luckily He's still safe and he's he's doing all right now. But that was definitely a scary period of time where I was like, who cares about preserving these rock band games? You know, we care <laughs> about crazy. We, we care about crazy safety. But he's just been sh- so matter matter of fact about it. You know, he's just been like, oh yeah, well, you know, non-zero chance I'll get hit by a bomb, but you know, it's less than less than fifty percent chance. He thinks. But I'm like, still though, <laughs> you know, you didn't have to go out of your way to do that for us. What is the ultimate goal of the project? Do you just want to release a ROM of these games out there for everyone to play, or is there something more? I guess our end goal is definitely to try to emulate these games because, like, if you, if you if you have the game files, that's one thing, but developing an emulator in conjunction would also be another good thing. So yeah, in the end, we want to release. Well, we we would like to release the files and also have an emulator. The emulator is legal. The problem is is that the files and everything. That's a little legally dubious, but since Capcom hasn't done anything with these games for like 15 years at this point, 20 years, it's like, you know, what what harm could be done? But if Capcom does decide to release them in any shape or form, then we'll probably have to stop releasing the ROM. But like all those kind of specifics are probably going to be decided upon once we actually get the game files off, which is probably going to be a long time before that happens. But yeah, in an ideal world, yes, I'd love to distribute the Java game file and and have the emulator set up so as many people can play this as possible. Because not everyone, of course, has a flip phone, right? And not everyone's going right. to have the ability to play this game on the flip phone. The year is still fairly new. So what are some of the goals for the Preservation Project in 2023? Some of the key goals that we're trying to do right now is first... Um, reverse engineer this bootloader from our exe phones NAND chip. Um, we're hoping that through analyzing this bootloader, we can figure out the, the workings of the entirety of the NAND chip. And from doing that, we can reverse engineer the phone's firmware. And from there, we can get into the file system where we can locate the Java games. That's what we're hoping to do because we had some trouble reading the NAND chip as a whole, but we could read that bootloader. So we're crossing our fingers that the bootloader will be enough to help us understand the firmware. And on, on the Five Island side, um, currently I, uh, one of our team members named Bincat, Bincat's the one working on the bootloader. I believe Craze is the one who's working on trying to dump our Five Islands phones firmware. Because inside that firmware is the final device key. And if we have that one more device key, we should hopefully be able to um, do the entire decryption on all of these encrypted Five Islands files. And I'm just hoping that there isn't another layer of encryption underneath what we already have, but that's that's another headache for later. I'll just assume that after we crack this one layer, it'll be done. Like they, they, they can't possibly screw us over again. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> How can people outside the project contribute? Are you doing any fundraising or should we just be mailing you phones or something? <laughs> uh, well, let's see. <laughs> Mailing us phones would be pretty nice, but um, currently the main thing that we need is just more people to hear about feature phones in general. Um, It's definitely something that's not being talked about enough in the gaming sphere and the game preservation sphere in general. Mm. I think this is probably due to how um, exclusive they were to Japan and that not many people got to experience them. And also just because they are dumb phone games and most people, especially people in the Western world, um, see dumb phone games as oh snake or or um or or are they really really simplistic mini games? Mm. But they don't truly understand the depth, you know, or they don't know about the depth of these types of games that are released in Japan. So I think just spreading the word about them is going to generate a lot of interest. And the more people that know about these games, 
the greater chance that we can find more technically minded people who can help us out on the more hardware, technical, software related front. Because if there's one thing that the entire feature fund preservation community needs at large, not just our team, it's definitely more technically minded people. And that's exactly what I hope to accomplish with this podcast and other things similar to it is just yeah, spreading the word and making sure more and more people know about these games. Because I fear that um, the phone hardware, it was not meant to last over 20 years. And a lot of these phones are pushing 20 years. And I fear that once these phones' hardwares die, uh, the games are going to be lost forever because if there's no hardware, you can't play the games. So I do think time is of the essence because time is ticking. And yeah, I think just also, um, let's see, a year ago, the iMode website shut down and that was the yes. final storefront for these types of feature phone games available. And that shut down and thousands of thousands of games were lost to time. And luckily, the Game Preservation Society was able to download over 700 games onto SD cards, but still a lot of games were lost. And, and and when that day happened, I didn't see many people talking about that, right? Like thousands of games were lost to time, but a few people were mentioning it. And that just showed me, yeah, you know, not enough people are talking about these things. And it's just because it was just so regionally exclusive to Japan. And hopefully now with these efforts, more and more people will get to know about how incredible and groundbreaking these games actually were. There, there are more than just games on a flip phone. There are the precursors to model, modern mobile gaming as we know it. The Japanese market, of course, is still a big player in the mobile gaming space, and there's a lot of franchises with titles exclusive to mobile hardware. On Apple Arcade, you can play Amazing Bomberman from Konami and Choo Choo Rocket from Sega. Is there any risk for these games to be lost or difficult to preserve like the feature phone games? Or has technology gotten to a point where newer titles are much easier to preserve. So I'm not exactly um, involved with like the modern mobile preservation scene, but what I can see um, from an outsider's point of view is I doubt they're facing the same difficulties as we are because I, they're probably easier ways to crack these modern devices, especially um, the non-Japanese phones. But I do think that there is a little bit of a danger in digital games currently, like. Already, the Google Play Store is delisting like super duper old um, like Android apps, mm. and that's already happening. Like we're already losing super duper old Android apps, and I, I know that there is a, definitely a rush to preserve as many as possible. But I do fear that a lot of these mobile exclusive games will become forgotten, right? Or like for example, I don't know, Fortnite's a good example, or other games that are online only they're digital only and they just have continuous updates and they keep going on forever it's like who's going to preserve fortnite version 1.01 for example (laughs) you know because you got so many different versions coming out so it's almost like a different conundrum than the future phone games where future phone games like they, they couldn't really be updated or if a lot of them had those kind of updates but here you got these continuously moving online games and what's going to happen when they're all dead and buried, right? Like, mm. especially when the servers are shut down, you know, who, who's going to keep them alive? Like most recently, um, the Final Fantasy VII First Soldier Battle Royale game shut down. I know there's definitely a rush to preserve as many assets and music from that game as possible. So it's definitely, I, I think future phone games are just like the first crisis that we're going to face with mobile gaming, you know? And I, and I think that we should probably be aware of this before it's too late because it really stinks to have another iMode website crisis situation where, oh my goodness, you know, these games are going to, all these old games will be delisted and how are we going to find a way to save them? But I do have confidence that with the more modern the hardware, I think it might be easier to crack into. But then again, I'm not someone who's technically involved with these modern mobile games. So I might be wrong with that. Well, I'm glad I got the chat with you about this amazing endeavor. So Rockman Cosmo, how can people find you? Uh, people can find me on Twitter at Rockman Cosmo. That's just Rockman, C-O-S-M-O. I also have a website, uh, rockmancosmo.weebly.com. Over there, you can find examples of my other projects and also my email address. And I guess if you want to get technically involved with feature phone preservation, I highly recommend joining the Discord server named Kavi Break. That's K-A-H-V-I-B-R-E-A-K. There are some great technically minded people there. And if you want to help out on that front, they'd be more than welcome to talk with you about it. 
Great. And listeners, the links to everything are in the podcast description. Rockman Cosmo, once again, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thank you for having me on. And thanks to everyone who listened. Once again, thanks to Rockman Cosmo for chatting with me. Be sure to follow him on social media. Check the podcast description for details. The first big Nintendo game of 2023 is Fire Emblem Engage, the latest entry in Intelligent Systems' long-running strategy RPG. This is probably the fifth time I've mentioned this on the podcast, but Intelligent Systems had a truly godlike streak of releasing games on Nintendo hardware. From 1998 to 2021, they released at least one game on Nintendo hardware every year. Every year. 2022 sadly broke one of the longest streaks in gaming history. No, Fire Emblem Warriors Three Hopes doesn't count since Omega Force is credited as the developer, even though some IS folks did contribute. Wikipedia agrees with me, and who are we to doubt them? But thankfully, IS has bounced back and released a true blue, full-blown Fire Emblem game in the opening weeks of 2023. And so far, it's meeting the high expectations I have for the series. I guess I should establish my Fire Emblem street cred. Like everyone, I was blown away by Marth and Roy in Melee and had to know more. I did buy the original GBA game, aka Blazing Blade, at launch. I got about halfway through it before I dropped it because I found the permadeath mechanic pretty frustrating. So I ignored the series for about a decade due to the permadeath mechanic, but when Fire Emblem Awakening came out and had casual mode, well hey, now is as good a time as any to jump back into the franchise. And that's a bit ironic considering casual mode was actually introduced in the Japan-only Mystery of the Emblem remake on DS. But since Awakening, I've been in love with the franchise. I played through Awakening, Birthright, and Conquest, sadly skipped Shadows of Valencia because of the whole moving to Japan thing, but got back into it with Three Houses, which, by the way, was my game of the year in 2019, and to me is still a top-tier Switch title. So Engage has a lot to live up to. When the credits roll, I doubt it'll displace Three Houses, but so far I'm very, shall I say, engaged with the game. Many of the new mechanics are cleverly implemented, and it has the classic Fire Emblem gameplay that makes it a very tough title to put down. By the way, it's really hard not to use engaging as an adjective here. It's just stuck in my head, and I already made an engage joke, so I'll just try to power through. The talking point of engage thus far has been A, it pulled back on the socialization aspects, and B, it's more akin to the old school Fire Emblem titles. I feel that both of these are sort of an exaggeration, since the social aspects are here and are still prominent. And by old school Fire Emblem, do you mean before Three Houses? Before Awakening? The GBA games? I'm not quite sure where this is coming from, but I do think the maps are different from Three Houses in that they're more compact and less sprawling. I'm certainly spending a lot more time thinking about where to move my army since it's incredibly easy to get overwhelmed. Overall though, it does feel like what you'd expect from Fire Emblem. There's still the great feeling of seeing a hundred enemies on the map, wondering how on earth you're supposed to win, but then you slowly start to unravel the level's layers and push your team ahead to victory. The biggest new mechanic is the Emblem Ring, which lets you fight alongside classic FE heroes. These rings boost your stats and give you special passive abilities, but when you engage with them, you transform and unlock special abilities and weapons for a limited time. This is somewhat conceptually similar to the pair-up system in Awakening, but far less broken. It's not really two characters fighting together, just think of it as one buffed up unit. While the buffs are certainly notable, and those with emblem rings are essentially some of the biggest contributors on the battlefield, these are pretty well balanced in that most of the bigger bonuses you receive are only available for three turns. You can recharge it, but it's important to carefully plan when you want to engage. Maybe you save it for the boss, or maybe the starting location is in a really tough area, so you need to pop it then to clear out some foes, and then hope you can recharge it before the battle is done. It's far more thoughtful than just some super attack. Though when you are engaged, you get access to a lot of fun attacks. You can use your emblem's weapons, like Mars Falcon or the Mercurius, which has unique stats and abilities, like granting double XP. Even your big bad special attack is way more than just some powerful strike. Salikas lets you warp far away, and Micaiah can heal your entire party at the cost of leaving you at 1 HP. 
You can also equip the emblems to any character, and syncing with them lets you permanently learn new skills. There is a mechanic that lets you boost your sync without actually equipping the ring, so that reduces a lot of the grind as well. Originally, I wasn't excited about the engage mechanic since the series in general is so heavy on fan service when it comes to the past. Like, you could use Marth and Iken Co. as DLC characters all the way back in Awakening. Plus, Fire Emblem Heroes, the phone game, is an entire game focused around using classic characters, so old school characters reappearing here wasn't really exciting on paper. But the mechanic undoubtedly works and gives players a lot of fun tools to use in battle. Though I don't think anything would be lost if you made the emblems original characters. Or hey, what if they were other Nintendo characters? Like instead of Sigurd, you can summon Wario or Mallow from Pushmo. This is a DLC people want. You might think, well, what about the other guys who don't have emblem rings? Fortunately, they get some bling too with the bond rings. There's a currency you can use to make rings based off of an emblem ring. These won't have crazy attacks or bonuses, but they do give some stat boosts. These rings are easy to make and you can fuse them to make them even stronger, so it does allow warriors who aren't using emblem rings to still get a passive boost in battle. These bond rings are based on lesser Fire Emblem characters, so it does remind me of the FE Heroes gotcha system a bit. In Fire Emblem, you need any stat boost you can get, and I think this is a clever mechanic to make sure your other characters don't feel left out. Another big mechanic is Break, which lets you disarm opponents, preventing counterattacks. The weapon triangle is thankfully back, so if you score a type advantage hit, you can have a chance of inflicting Break. This helps players understand the value of obeying the Holy Weapon Triangle, and is a great benefit for abiding by it. I've managed to topple enemies that could have easily destroyed me on counterattacks thanks to the break mechanic. It's also fun to just see their weapon fly up in the air, but they pick them up the next turn, so don't get too excited. There's also battle styles, which are affixed to a unit. It gives them passive buffs based on their role, like armor makes you immune to break, for instance. Nothing big, but it helps make classes stand out a bit more. Another small but useful mechanic is the chain attack, which is similar to the dual system from the 3DS titles. If a character has a backup battle style, they can jump in for an extra attack. So you really have to be aware of the roles and skills wielded by your army. While the core gameplay battle mechanics hasn't changed all that much, these new additions work well together and allow for a lot of freedom in how you fight. Oh, and another cool thing about the battles is that you can now freely walk in a character's range instead of picking a square and then watching them move. A small change, but it makes battles feel more active and there's less downtime watching animations. And after the battle, you can walk around the battlefield in a fully rendered 3D space. It's kind of trippy to see a map you looked at from a bird's eye view suddenly become a place you can explore. In one battle, the enemy burned a house, and when I got to freely walk around the battlefield from a new camera angle, it will still burn down. If I had to lobby a criticism, so far the maps have been all route the enemy or defeat the commander. I'm sure they're saving some of the more spicier ones down the line. I'm only at chapter 8 for now, but I'd like to see a bit more variety even early on. So battles, classic Fire Emblem with fun new mechanics. Everything's going great so far. But what about after the battles? You've got the Somniel, your home base which is a literal castle in the sky. It's not as big or active as Garrick Mach, but there's still plenty of things to do and you can easily spend 30 plus minutes after each battle just checking out the new additions or taking part in other activities. You've got an exercise minigame that lets you get a temporary stat boost, an arena that gives you a bit more XP and improves your bond with emblems, which unlocks new abilities. You can look at animals you've adopted, pet Sami, which is the best character of the year so far. I was thinking that the post-battle activities would be diminished, but they're still rather abundant. In terms of socialization with your party members, the support combos are still there, and yes, you can even eat with them. No tea time, sadly, though. The thing about Fire Emblem characters is that they are purposefully one-dimensional. Everyone has some sort of personality quirk that dominates their dialogue. One character likes working out. One character likes chocolate. One character likes to raise birds or whatever. But the fun comes from seeing how they interact with each other. What is the guy who loves cooking going to say to the aristocratic, arrogant girl? That's part of the fun of Fire Emblem. Maybe there's technically less dialogue and activities with your party members compared to Three Houses, but you can still spend quite a lot of time with your favorite characters. But since there are no school classes or anything like that, the game has fewer opportunities to boost proficiencies or other stats. The great thing about Three Houses 
is that you could get incredibly granular with each unit in terms of their stat growth, and could even do a 180 and make them master a new thing fairly quickly. Here, a lot of these stat adjustments are tied with the emblem rings and learning permanent skills from them. I'm still fairly early, so I haven't been able to create any sort of crazy character with a lot of mishmash skills, but I'm hoping I'll be able to make some real niche fighters and give characters some fun loadouts. I've taken a peek at some of the classes and they seem pretty typical for a Fire Emblem game. The one that stands out for me is Wolf Knight. Hey, I want to ride a wolf. I know Fates gets a lot of hate, but that game had a lot of really unconventional and fun classes. You could be a knife throwing maid or a ninja riding a mechanical monster. There was a lot of creativity there. One big departure from Three Houses is certainly the story. Here it feels almost like a greatest hits of Fire Emblem tropes and conventions. You are the chosen one. The bad guy is a big evil dragon. People are introduced who are clearly going to die ASAP. There's a bunch of MacGuffins you need to chase down. If you are hooked by the political drama and morally great characters of Three Houses, this game might be a bit jarring at first. It's much sillier and a bit more Saturday morning cartoonish. It's not bad by any means, but Three Houses hooked me instantly and the story got better as the game progressed. They did introduce a lot more fantastical concepts later on in the game, but even those held my attention and were really unexpected. I'm not sure if Engage has any tricks up its sleeve, but even if it doesn't, I think the plot of get the MacGuffins before the bad guys do is serviceable enough. It does feel more like a typical adventure where you're traveling to different parts of the world and trying to win over all these different people and cultures. And I think eventually you are going to team up and then fight a big bad dragon. Another major departure from Three Houses, and every Fire Emblem game now that I think about it, is the more vibrant art style. The characters are designed by Mika Picasso, an artist famous for her VTuber creations. I went to her exhibit in December and talked about it on the podcast, but she has a very incredibly modern, bright, and kinetic art style that you wouldn't associate with typical sword and sorcery high fantasy. But I think that's exactly why she was chosen for this game. Ever since Awakening with Yusuke Kozaki's art, Nintendo has showcased Fire Emblem as a fantasy game with more modern stylings. There's a lot of rule of cool in terms of character designs from the 3DS era on. Practicality isn't the focus. I think I would still put Kozaki on top in terms of character designs I connect with, but I do like a lot of Engage's cast from a visual standpoint. Alir, the protagonist, has a very striking design. Put me on Team Joy-Con hair. Celine is a bit more ridiculous though, she kind of looks like a Christmas ornament. In general though, I like the influx of color in the game. Three houses looked incredibly drab and the cell shaded characters clash with the more realistic setting. Here the environments have a consistent and beautiful color palette. One of the earlier battles is in fake Holland and it's spotted with fields of flowers and giant windmills. A recent battle had me fighting on a bridge at dusk amongst these red fall leaves. It's definitely the most visually impressive Fire Emblem game to date, even if you think the character designs are a bit too out there or clownish. I don't have a strong opinion on the music yet. It'll be hard to top Three Houses, but I'll give my diagnosis after I beat the game. I know I'm doing a lot of comparisons with Three Houses, but I'm having a great time with Engage thus far, and I always get the urge to play it. Even now, why am I podcasting instead of playing it? Again, I doubt I'll put it over Three Houses in the end, but don't take that as a slam against this game. There's always got to be one game at the top. I suppose the tricky thing is what to recommend for someone who is trying to get into the series. Three Houses or Engage. I think both are pretty distinctive enough to enjoy. I don't think Engage is some major upgrade from Three Houses. They both focus on different elements, yet still have that great core gameplay. You really can't go wrong either way. And for fans who loved Three Houses, I do think Engage will scratch that strategy RPG itch. I mean, I could play a Fire Emblem game every year. I was hoping we'd get a remake in between Three Houses and Engage, but I'm sure we will get another FE game before the Switch wraps up. I'll share my final thoughts in an episode or two after I beat this thing. That's it for games, now for the news. Hmm, no Nintendo Direct yet. It's coming though, it's coming. But until then, let's look at some other news. How about a mini feature? A few weeks ago, I visited Tokyo Game Dungeon, an indie game event in Hamamatsucho. This is a pretty unorthodox place to host a game event since that area has no nerdy connections. It's next to two beautiful parks, Hamariku Garden and Kyushibariku Gardens. 
You can also ride a ferry, which you should do any chance you get in Tokyo. But anyways, this was the second Tokyo Game Dungeon event. It's nowhere near as big as Digital Games Expo from last year, but it was larger than I expected. But yeah, a lot of the games I saw at Digital Games Expo reappeared here. Yup, Ninja or Die returned, Bear Runner, the game where you hit the Famicom to purposefully glitch out the game, also returned and was in a much more visible spot. And I chatted with Chris from Connie Pro Games, the developer of Violet Wisteria, which I talked about on this podcast. He recently announced that Violet Wisteria is coming out on February 9th, so put that date down on your calendar. There were several games I came across for the first time, though. One was Reach to Sukuyomi, an 8-bit-styled 2D platformer with a medieval Japanese aesthetic. You're a girl with a sword, and you slice your way through yokai. There's a nice three-hit combo. You can air dash, you can crawl, you can slice upward, throw shurikens. There's a cool teleport slice counter move. I had a lot of fun with the demo, and it's something I want to keep my eye on. Still seems pretty early though due to some graphical elements lagging, but hey, I always commend indie developers for showing off their game so early. Another game that stood out for me was Grappen. As the name suggests, it's a grappling hook game. It's first person and in the demo, you grapple around a serene icy landscape. It has a very clean art style and some nice tranquil atmosphere. It's also very generous with using the actual grappling hook. You can spam it against a wall to climb higher, which boosts your character up, which is a pretty fun mechanic. It's developed by Amin Hafidi, who has had an illustrious career in the Japanese gaming industry and has worked on projects from both Game Freak and Kojima Productions. Oh, and the main character was designed by Takaya Imamura, the art director of Star Fox and F-Zero. I mean, that's a huge get. I got to chat with Amin a lot at Tokyo Game Dungeon, which is really why you go to these things. Not only to play games, but to meet people and hear their stories. Grappen has a demo out on Steam now, so you can check it out. It's certainly worth a download. There's a couple of other indie game events coming to Tokyo in spring, and I'll try to pop by them. I have to admit, sometimes I'm a little shy when I'm face-to-face -face with the developer of a game, and they're just watching me play. Also, I need to make business cards for the podcast. This is my official reminder. Dokapon Kingdom Connect, a remake of the 2007 Wii game from Sting, is coming out in spring on Switch and elsewhere. It's a mix of RPG and party game. Think of it like Mario Party with stats. The game is quite notorious for allowing players to completely screw over their rivals and is said to be a real friendship ender. As you may have guessed, the Kinect means that this one has online gameplay, but I expect a lot of online rage quits. But it's awesome to see these smaller games get remasters and remakes. Not everything can be at the scale of the Dead Space remake, for example. Switch has a ton of party games that have sold big, Momotaru Dentetsu is a massive hit in Japan, so I can see Sting wanting a slice of that pie. I've never played the original, but here's my chance. Heads up, this new section is really all about gaps in my gaming history. And speaking of Sting, Ikdra Union is coming to Steam on February 7th. I would never have guessed that I would have two Sting-related updates in one episode, but here we are. Ikdra Union is a 2006 tactics game originally released for the GBA, but got some ports elsewhere. There actually is a Switch version already, but it's Japanese only. However, with this worldwide release on Steam, I think it's only a matter of time before the Switch gets the English version as well. Like Dokapon, I've never played it, but it's a title that I've always been interested in. Just look up this game. It has what I would describe as quintessential GBA graphics. Huge, colorful sprites. It's often on sale on the Japanese eShop, but I've never pulled the trigger, so maybe I'll just wait for the English version. So those games are coming out for sure. But let's look at the old rumor mail a bit. What's this? A Botan Kaitos remake? Website Xbuter is claiming that a remake of the 2003 card-focused JRPG Botan Kaitos is coming to Switch in 2023. And development is being handled by Monolith Soft, who created the series. This was when they were under Namco, so Namco does own the IP. But Namco and Nintendo are very buddy-buddy these days, with Namco developing a lot of games with Nintendo's IPs, so this rumor seems pretty likely. Also, considering Monolith Soft continues to pump out critically acclaimed games that sell well, I think they have some leeway in terms of what they work on. They help make Breath of the Wild a masterpiece. I'm sure they got a lot of goodwill from Nintendo for that. Sorry, Botan Kaitos is another game I haven't played yet. I'm 0 for 3 here, but hey, 
they're coming back, so I'll fill those gaps eventually. But I love remakes for stuff like this. Things like a Skyward Sword remaster are not really exciting to me. I want to revisit these oddities from days gone past and see if they can get a new audience with improved game mechanics. If Baten Kaitos is real, it's definitely something I'll pick up out of sheer curiosity. Last bit of news, I mentioned this last episode, but Surugaya and Akihabara somehow got a huge stock of never-opened Nintendo games from the Game Boy Color and N64 era. These are brand spanking new. They even come in these huge cardboard boxes with the game logo plastered on it. I guess these are boxes that were shipped to stores, but they were never opened. Again, I don't know how they got these, but it does give me hope that there are more crates of brand new retro games just floating around out there. The most notable games are Pokemon Stadium 2, aka the Gold and Silver one, and Donkey Kong Jungle Beat. I bought Pokemon Stadium 2, despite me already owning it. I mean, it was only 330 yen, and new. I am now regretting not picking up Card Hero, but that game is cheap everywhere, and I can always just go back. Not sure how many people want dozens of copies of Card Hero. Now for the Japanese gaming phrase of the week. This week's phrase is Gurabo. Gurabo. It's short for graphics board. A more appropriate name for it would be video card in English. It's what you would stick in your computer to make the graphics all pretty. How much is the latest NVIDIA graphics card? Like a thousand dollars? I haven't had a gaming PC for several years now, but I assume building one is pretty much the same as it was years ago. Just carefully put more and more expensive parts into a big glowing box. And the Japanese tweet of the week. I picked one from Tayo Mati. It's a pyramid of dominoes that fall down and make a Mario face. I have no idea how people do this. I guess it's a mix of hard work and a level of patience I don't have, but I can only watch in awe after I see hours of work fall down in just a few seconds. As always, the tweet is in the description. And that's all for now. Thanks as always for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast on your favorite app. Leave a five-star review as well. It really helps with visibility. The podcast is also available on YouTube, so like and subscribe there as well. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Just search for Tokyo Game Life or find the links in the podcast description. If you like the podcast, be sure to share it with your friends and on social media. If there's anything you want me to talk about or cover, don't be shy. Just message me on Twitter. The next episode will be on February 12th. See you next time. Matane! Matane!